Today, my father is going to be sharing the message with us again. He's, he's about to go on another one of his world tours here and be gone a lot for the next few months. And so it's great to have him uh, while we get a chance to have him. I did tell him this morning the pressure is really on him because this is the first message of the year. And how this message goes will probably determine how our year goes. The success of us as a church and as us as individuals is riding on the first. This sets the tone. This is the foundation for the whole year right here. But I can tell you, uh, he's got a good message, so we're going to be all right. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward. One of the requests I'm going to make for 2019 is I get a chance to introduce you. <laughs> oh, well. I can handle it. I can take it. Well, church, it is the, the first Sunday of 2019. Amen. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <clears throat> Amen. How many believe it's going to be a better year than 2018? You believe in that? I believe in that. Well, you know, I, I want to talk to you a bit about that this morning. And, you know, I just, you know, I, I, as I prayed about this, I felt like, you know, I've gone down, I'm going to go down a certain pathway. It's not, it's not a typical message that you would normally hear for uh, a first uh, message in, the, in, a, in a year. But I, I'm stirred about this. And uh, as I was, like probably most of you, I was uh, evaluating 2018, evaluating my life, and um, wanting 2019 to be better than 2018. Amen? Is that, would that be true of you as well, that... You know, I think it's a, a time of evaluation over the, over the holidays that we've had and thinking, you know, I want to I wanna have increase in my life. I want to get closer to the Lord. I, I want to do better uh, in, in the spiritual disciplines of my life, in the area of prayer, the area of reading the Word, seeking Lord, uh, fasting, just calling on God, worship, praise. I just feel like I can raise the bar in my own life, amen? And I, I think that's true of all of us and, and, and in many different areas. And so as I started thinking about that and started digging into this a bit more, um, I thought, you know, I, I, need to, I need to deal with, I need to deal with some things. And, uh, you know, lots of times, in, in, especially in January, you say, well, man, I want to give up some things. I want to I live a healthier lifestyle. I'm, I'm going to give up coffee, or I'm going to give up chocolate, or I want to even give up Facebook. Um, I'm going to become proactive. Um, and, but those things aren't easy. I mean, we make New Year's resolutions, and most of the time we don't even get till the end of January, and we're not doing it. Amen? I mean, all you have to do is go down to the field house here right now, and it'll be packed out. But I'll guarantee you, by February the 1st, it'll be back to the way it was before, <laughs> for the most part. Um, but, you know, there are, there, it's, not easy. It's, not easy to, it's not easy to pray. It's not easy to, do in, to discipline yourself in any area of your life. And, uh, but nevertheless, we, we have choices. We can choose. I mean, if I want to pray more, uh, that totally lies within, within my choice. Amen? If I want to read my Bible more, it's totally in my hands. If I, if I want to, to eat healthier, if I want to exercise more, that's totally within my control. Would you agree? I can decide to do it or not to do it. But as I began to look at this and look at the whole issue of discipline and the spiritual disciplines, I began to realize that there are some disciplines that, that not only do we have choices as to what happens in our life, but there's another person out there who also makes choices to do with your, your life and my life. And that's God. Amen? And he also has some disciplines that he wants us to enter into in our personal lives. And there are disciplines that he releases into our life that we did not choose, and we would not choose them. Uh, but we... We need to make some other choices in 2019. If you want a, a more fruitful year in 2019, there are some other choices that you and I need to make, not only personally, but even corporately. And we need to choose what we would not choose. We need to choose what we did not, what, which we would not choose. And I uh, say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, James says this. He said, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. He didn't say if. He said, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How many of you would like to come to a place in your life where you lack nothing? 
Does that sound good? It sounds like, man, I want, I want to come to a place in my life where I don't lack anything. Hey, God, would you bless me? Would you just pour out all the blessing that I would lack nothing in my life? Well, hold on a sec here. It, it, it rides in on a train called Various Trials. I don't think that many of us in this room this morning have that verse underlined in our Bibles. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. You know, Jesus said the very same thing. He said, you know, blessed are you. Do you want to be blessed? Are we looking for more blessing in 2019? Jesus said, blessed are you when people insult you. How's that? And persecute you. And falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same ways they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How many want a, a great reward in heaven? You want your reward to be great. Well, God does too. And what he does, he says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you my, some of my disciplines into your life. And you have a choice as to what you're going to do with those disciplines that, that I'm going to put into your life. And so a sovereign God, when we, when we read the scriptures... He, Hebrews says, we don't like these verses, but Hebrews says, if you're a son, I'm gonna di I discipline every son that I choose. Ah, oh, man, I don't like that. But if we're going to be a son, if you're going to be an heir, if you're going to inherit what God has for you. Now, this isn't, a, this isn't a fluff message. This isn't a milk message. This is a meat message. So we're going to start off in 2019, not as vegetarians, but as meat eaters. And so, Joel, you want to know what the, the temple's going to be for 2019? Here we go. We're going to eat meat this year. We'll hand out free toothpicks, but uh, you're going to eat meat. And so things come into our lives. God allows certain things to come into our life that we would never would have chosen. It may be all kinds of difficulties. It may be, it may be a child that has needs. It may be a health issue. It may be a financial issue. Maybe, maybe you can't find a job. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you have a job, but, but, it, but you, it's, not, it's, it's, uh, it's a job that, that's, uh, you're underemployed. It's not a job that fits your qualifications or your skill level. And it's frustrating. Or maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe it's, maybe it's a broken relationship with a child or a grandchild. Or, a, or maybe it's a strain in the marriage. Or it could be any number of things. And we look at those things, well, that's the devil. I need to kick the devil out. And... I need to rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus all that trial away. Well, you know what? I want to tell you something. I've lived long enough and I've been a Christian long enough that you just can't in the name of Jesus every trial away. It doesn't quite work like that in your time frame and in, your, in the way in which you want your life to go. Is that not true? And in fact, every one of us in this room here this morning, every one of us has issues in our life right now that we wish were not issues in our life. Would that be true? That there are things that we wish we didn't have to deal with. We wish that things were better in this particular area of my life. I think that's true of all of us. Say, man, you know, if I could just, you know, when I just get back, all my, get rid of all my problems, I will be happy, I will be glad, and I will rejoice. I have, I have something to want to say to you. You will never be without problems. That, that life does not exist. Amen? You will never be without challenges in your life. Never. I mean, I'm 71 years old, and I kind of realize by now, you know what? I've been a Christian for almost 50 years. I had my share of problems, and I still have them. And I'm, I now realize problems are a part of life. And, you, you know, you have a major problem that occupies most of your time. And if you solve that problem, then you have a lesser one that's not getting a lot of, t a lot of your attention. But it would elevate up, and this would occupy your time. And that's welcome to life on planet Earth. There's coming a day when God will wipe away every tear and you will enter into your, your sovereign wrath. That day is coming for all of us, but it's not yet. It's not yet. So I have to learn how to deal with this. And so I have three responses that I can make to the disciplines that God puts into my life in the form of difficulties or the form of trials, which are there to mature me, which are there to strengthen my faith, which are there to strengthen my relationship with him. They're, they're there for good, not for evil. Depends on what I do, and I have three responses that I can make. And the first response that I can make to those kinds of situations is I can rebel. Amen? And you know what? We don't have to learn how to do that. That's our natural default setting. We get angry. 
God, where are you? How come you allowed this thing to come into my life? I'm mad at you. I'm mad at the people around me that, that are responsible for this. And so I have a lot of anger. And, and uh, Lord, uh, I don't know what you're doing here, and I really question your goodness at this particular time. But can I tell you, that's a dangerous response because that actually compounds your pain. And that actually compounds your difficulty. That's not a good response. But it's a natural response. Well, the second response we can make is we can resign. We say, I quit. I quit. I'm going to quit being a Christian. I'm not praying anymore. Doesn't work. Not reading my Bible anymore. Not going to go to church anymore. Doesn't work. God, you've disappointed me. I'm going to quit. I'm going to lay down. I'm going to give in to despair. I'm just going to give up. You can, you can choose that response, and people do. You can make that response. <clears throat> and in a sense of no hope, there's no ability to pray. No life can grow in those kinds of conditions. You're not growing. You're going backwards. But then there's a third response. We can rejoice. You say, are you crazy? I can rejoice in the midst of difficulty. I can rejoice in the midst of trial and difficulty and, and whatever I'm going through. I can rejoice on that. That can be my response. Absolutely which is the response which Jesus is talking about and which James is talking about. Jesus said this, blessed, I will read it again. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. And in case you didn't understand what he meant by rejoice, he said, be glad. He said, is, is he crazy? How can I be glad and rejoice in a time like that. What Jesus is saying is, I want you to choose that posture in life. I want, you to, I want you to embrace that discipline. You see, when I rejoice and I'm glad, I'm choosing what I didn't choose, which is the title of this message. Choosing what you didn't choose. Nobody's going to say, hey, Lord, would you send a few fresh trials my way? We don't pray prayers like that. Amen? We would never ask for that. But you know what? God sends them, and we don't ask for them. He, we get them anyways. And then I have a choice. I can rebel, I can quit, or I can embrace. Say, okay, I'm going to choose what I didn't choose. I'm going to do that. James says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Say, well, how could I ever get to that place? What, how, how could I get to that spot? How could I... How could I come to that place of posture in my personal life? There are two things that I want to talk about this morning that I think are critical in helping us get to that place. The first thing is this. Know that God is with you. Know that God is with you. And I want to talk to you about a couple of guys that most of you are familiar with, Jacob and Esau. And of course, those are twin boys talked about in Genesis. And, and there was a guy named Isaac, uh, who was, uh, his father was Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and then there was Jacob. And so Isaac uh, married a woman named Rebecca. And uh, at first she couldn't get pregnant, but then she did get pregnant. After Isaac prayed for her for many years, she finally got pregnant, and she had twins. And uh, as these two ch ch uh, babies began to grow in her womb, she realized there's struggle going on in my womb. It's, it's almost like these two boys are fighting. And she was correct. They were fighting. There was a struggle going on within her, even before they're born. They're at one another. And so she prays. She goes before the Lord one day and says, God, what's going on here? And the Lord speaks to her and says, there are two nations in your womb. And then he says this astounding thing. The younger will serve the older. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. the older will serve the younger. Which was backwards, because in that, in that culture, in that time, the younger always served the, the older. And the older was the firstborn, and the firstborn got the double portion of the inheritance. And, and the older son, the firstborn, got the blessing. And the whole idea of getting the, the, the double portion and getting the blessing was that the older was going to be, was going to be the patriarch of the family, would take the place of the father uh, in the, going forward into the future, and was responsible for the well-being of the whole family and was ahead, become the head of the family, and therefore got extra resources in order to carry that out. Now, unfortunately, many times it didn't work like that. The older simply took the resources for themselves. But the whole point was, was to bless the family. Well, well when they were born, uh, Esau was born first, but Jacob came out holding his heel, uh, which was also a prophetic act, which basically was saying that the older would serve the younger. 
that the younger would get the double portion, that the younger would get the blessing. And so I'm, I, I know for, I'm sure that, that Rebecca told Isaac, hey, Isaac, guess what? Uh, there's going to be a reversal here, and God spoke to me, and, and Esau is going to serve Jacob, not the other way around. Well, Esau wasn't, I mean, Isaac wasn't buying into it. And so as these two boys grew up, Isaac uh, favored Esau, and Rebecca favored Jacob. And Isaac just couldn't bring himself to the place of, of believing and embracing uh, what God had said here concerning Esau. Well, as, as the boys got older, uh, and as Isaac got older, Rebecca and Jacob began to get a little panicky, saying, well, we know what God's will is. We know what the prophetic word is, that Jacob should get the double portion, but we're afraid that uh, because Isaac's not buying into this, that we need to kind of take matters into our own hands here. And so uh, they began to scheme and manipulate, and finally one day, uh, Jacob uh, cooked up this beautiful pot of stew that Esau liked so much, and when Esau was really hungry, he said, hey, Esau, uh, how about you sell me your birthright for a pot of stew, which he, he did. He sold it. He sold his double inheritance to Jacob. Jacob got him in a weak moment and tricked him and manipulated him. Well, then as time, a bit time, further time went on, Isaac was about to die, and he's about to pass on the family blessing. He's blind. So then uh, Rebekah schemes with Jacob and said, hey, uh, we got to steal Esau's blessing as well. Uh, it's your right. It's prophetically, it's your destiny, but we got to help God out here a little bit. And so they dress Jacob up as Esau. Jacob goes in and steals his blessing as well which was the prophetic blessing of prosperity and dominance and that, the, and that Esau would, would, serve, uh, would serve Jacob. And all this came out of the prophetic blessing. Well, when Esau found out about this, he didn't take it, he didn't take it laying down. He was really mad. In fact, he was so angry, he said, I'm going to kill Jacob. Now, you know what? Rebecca wasn't, wasn't figuring on that. And I don't think Jacob was either. You know what? He's going to kill you. And he wasn't just like a little bit mad. He was actually meaning it. I'm going to kill him. And so now for the first time, Isaac and Rebecca get on the same page. They're not finding each other anymore. He said, we got a problem here. If, if Esau kills Jacob, we're going to lose both our sons. And so they thought, we got to get, we got to get Jacob out of here. We got to get him out of Dodge. We got to come up with a reason for him to leave town while the going's good. And so they figure out, you know, he needs a wife. And we don't want him marrying any of the gals, uh, any of the Canaanites. So let's send them back to Haran where we came from and he can get a wife from one of our relatives. So good idea, except it's 600 miles away. And he isn't just hopping in his car and driving to Calgary. He's walking. And there are dangers and there are robbers and it's a dangerous time. And so Jacob flees. Esau's a hunter. He's worried about Esau. Man, what if this guy catches up to me? He's going to kill me. He's good at this stuff. And so I think that Jacob was frightened I think he was discouraged. He's in a desolate place. And one night he lays down and has a sleep. And it says in Genesis 28, verse 10, Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place, and put it under his head, and laid down in that place. And he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's what Esau sold for a pot of stew. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. And he called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Wow. So what did he see? He saw in a dream a reality that he wouldn't have seen otherwise. He saw into another world. 
He saw heaven. He saw into another dimension. He saw a ladder going from earth into heaven. And he said, wow, this is the, this is the first sci-fi experience that anybody has ever had. He saw a portal into the next dimension. Amen? He said, what a spot, Bethel. This is where it is. The very doorway into the next dimension is right here. I saw a ladder. Wow. And, and, uh, he, and, but the thing that was most powerful was that God was with him. God stood at the very top of the ladder and said, I'm with you. I'm with you. And so Jacob thought, well, you know, this is this spot. It's Bethel. But what he didn't realize is that, no, 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 it, wherever Jacob was, God was with him. Because if you read further on about Jacob in Genesis, you find out he had several angelic encounters as he went through his life. When he went back to Canaan, the angels met him, the Bible says. We don't know exactly anything more than that, but the angels met him. We know he wrestled with the angel and, and got a blessing. And we know that he had other angelic experiences. And so this was a continuous, it didn't matter, it didn't have to be right at Bethel. That God was with Jacob wherever he went. A stairway to God wherever he went. But then in John's gospel, we have another amazing uh, dissertation about this because it says Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. Jesus is, cho is choosing his disciples. He saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite, indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What is Jesus saying to Nathanael? You also are going to see Jacob's ladder, as we call it. And can I tell you that ladder is Jesus? And you have a ladder right to heaven. You know that this morning? That there is a ladder. See, what's the, what's the whole issue of angels ascending, descending? What are angels? Angels are, do two things. They are messengers of God. They are carrying messages between you, us and God. Amen? They, all, they carry our prayers. Not only that, angels watch over you. Angels protect you. You are protected more than you realize. God is watching over you. He knows everything about you. Amen? Your God is with you. And when I get up every morning, see, no matter what I am facing, no matter what difficulty I'm facing, I have a ladder to heaven. And God is standing at the top of that ladder. And there's a direct connection between me and him. And whether you feel it or not does not change it. I mean, Jacob did not know that God was with him until he had a dream. Many times we do not realize how much God is really with us. He is with you. He's with you in every difficulty, every situation. He is in control. He knows exactly where you are. He knows what's in your mind. He is absolutely in control. Amen? And he has amazing promises for you and I. And he wants us to believe those promises. Jacob said this. He said, he said God, because God said, I'm going to prosper you. You're going to spread out east, west, north, and south. Your descendants are going to be like the dust. And so he went on and on. And Jacob said, hey, since this is true, the Bible says, if you do this, I'll, I'll give you a tithe. But actually, in the Hebrew, it could very easily be, just as easily be translated, since you are going to do this for me, I will give you a tenth of all. Isn't that really interesting? What, Jacob's response? I'm going to give you a tithe of every bit of increase that you give me. I'm going to give you a tithe. Many times we think, well, tithing is not, you say, well, you know, do we have to tithe? This is New Testament times. A tithing was part of Moses' law. Moses' law is gone. I'm not under the law. I don't, I, shouldn't, I don't need a tithe of all that God gives me anymore. Hey, we're missing the whole point. This is not about what ja when Jacob says, I'm going to tithe you 10% of everything you give me. What's he saying by the tithe? He's saying, God, I believe you. I believe you're in control. I believe you're with me. I believe you're my, you're my, you're my provider. I believe that everything that I have, is, it came from you. And I, because you're watching over me and because you're protecting me and because you're providing for me, I'm going to glorify you. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose that. I'm going to embrace that. And to show you that I'm serious, I'm going to give you a tithe of all that you give me. It has nothing to do with Old Testament, New Testament. That has to do with an automatic response of a human being towards God. So if you say, is tithing for today? Of course it's for today. 
Amen? This had nothing to do with the law. This had everything to do with the response of Jacob to God's promise of being with him, of his provision and his protection. If I believe that and I want to honor God and I want to accept that, I want to glorify God, then I will do the very same thing. Amen? That is the right response for you and I just as much today as it was for Jacob. He had a ladder. So do we. We have a better ladder. His name is Jesus. Amen? <clears throat> Jesus is our bridge. And so as you go through Scripture, whether it be Gideon or Joshua or Moses or us, God keeps saying these same words, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Amen? In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven, he said, surely I'm with you always, always to the very end of the age. So if I know that Jesus is with me always, can I rejoice and be glad in the midst of disciplines I did not choose? Can I do that? I can if I remember that. If I remember, you know what, God, this isn't looking good for me right now. I'm not enjoying this very much. Lord, I got all kinds of problems. I got all kinds of difficulties. But you know what? You're with me, and you're my protector, and you're watching over me, and you promised to bless me, and you're for me and not against me, and you're in control, and I don't know what's all happening here, and I don't want to understand about it. I'm going to embrace it, and I'm going to choose what I did not choose. Paul said this, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate, separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is, that, what is he talking Nothing can separate us from the love of God. What does that actually mean? Say, I'm just feeling the love. Oh, yeah. No, what it actually means is nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from his protection. Nothing can separate us from his provision. Nothing can separate us from, from all God's blessings upon my life. There's no trial, no demon, no difficulty that can stand between me and what God has for me. And my proper response to life and the difficulties of life is to rejoice and be glad. Not be angry. Not rebel. Not despair. Not quit, not give up. But I'm going to rejoice and be glad in the midst of the difficulty that I have because I know God is in control and God is for me and God is with me. And God has promised, he said to Jacob, I'm going to bring you back to this land. And I tell you something, God will bring you back to your inheritance. No matter where your life's journey takes you, no matter how desolate, no matter how far from home, God is with you, and God will bring you home. You're not lost. He will bring you home. The difficulties in your life and in my life, they're simply temporary. They're temporary. It's not the last story. And so the proper response is, I'm going to worship. I'm going to vow to you. I'm going to respond to you. The whole issue of giving a tenth was an act of worship and faith. And trust, which is the natural, which is the right response to the fact that God is with us. <clears throat> the, last, the second thing is the need to choose what I did not choose. See, so what do you mean by that? You know, these difficulties that we face in life, they're not meant to destroy us. God's not some torture guy up there that just wants to inflict pain in our lives. That's not what it's about. Actually, they're there to actually bring you to a maturity. God wants you not to mature. He wants us to grow in our faith. He wants us to grow to be more, more like Christ. He wants us to make us more Christ-like, both personally and corporately. Actually, actually, by me rejoicing and being glad in the midst of difficulty, it actually brings me into more freedom. Amen? Would you like more freedom in your life? Yes. I want to be free. I want to, move, I want to be free uh, in my own self, I want to be free, have more freedom from my flesh and more freedom from sin. I, I, want to, I want to enter into that freedom. Can I tell you that my response to the difficulties that come into my life, if I choose what I did not choose, it brings me more freedom. It actually brings me more liberty. It's amazing how that works. Instead of feeling like something's being taken from me, I suddenly see that because I've chosen it, 
It's something being offered to me. I'm actually receiving something. I'm not losing. I'm receiving. I'm gaining. You see, Jacob, when he did that, when he saw the ladder, when he said, okay, I'm going I'm to choose what I did not choose. I mean, I'm fleeing from, I mean, and Jacob, I mean, his situation was because of his own misdeeds. I mean, he put himself into that situation. Between him and his mom, they manipulated themselves into a situation where Esau wanted to kill him. I mean, Jacob brought that on himself, and still, instead of, in spite of that, God said, I'm, gonna, I'm with you, I'm going to help you, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to prosper you, and you, this trial that you're going through, Jake, where you're running for your life, you created that trial because of your unbelief. Amen? But in spite of it, I'm still with you, and I'm still going to help you, and I'm still going to prosper you, and I'm still going to bless you, and I'm going to bring you back here. And Jacob says, wow, okay, God, I'm going to embrace that, and I'm going to give you a tenth of all as worship to my God. I'm going to embrace your plan. I'm going to embrace your journey, even though it's difficult. You know, when uh, 40 years ago now, and it's been 40 years, um, Linda was 29 years old, and all of a sudden became very sick, very ill, just all, all in one night, boom. And uh, very quickly ended up in the Winnipeg General Hospital, and Got to a place where her, her, her life was hanging, was hanging the balance. She's 29 years old. I'm 31. Can I tell you, we're hurting. I went through all kinds. Of, my first response to that trial was I rebelled. I remember standing in the hallway of the Winnipeg General Hospital and shaking my fist at the ceiling and, and yelling at God and saying, God, how do you expect me to believe you for anything anymore? Those are my exact words. I yelled it out the top of my lungs. I didn't care who was around. I was so angry at God because a surgeon had just come and told me that he needed to operate on her and that she only had a 50-50 chance of even surviving the surgery. And that was my response. I repented a half an hour later, but that was still my response. And I'm, I'm confused, and I'm in pain, and I'm hurting, and Linda was in that hospital for 40 days. Well, when she got out of the hospital, she was down to 80 pounds, she was a skeleton, she was a wreck, she was not strong, and the surgery that she, she had gone through, she had went, gone through a major surgery and she was, still had another one coming. And, uh, and, and it had life consequences for her. Uh, it was gonna be something she's gonna have to live with for the rest of her life, which she has. And so I remember she got discharged in the afternoon of that on a, on a particular day, and. We had some friends, a pastor, a couple of friends in Winnipeg, and they said we could stay overnight with them because it was too late in the day to make the journey home. We had a 300-mile journey to get home, and Linda wasn't able, just, we just wasn't up for it. So we were able to stay at their house. And I remember Linda come out of the hospital, and I picked her up in the car, and we got in the car, and Linda said this to me. She said, Dave, I've been thinking about my whole situation and about our situation. I've made, I've made a decision. I made a decision that I'm going to have a good attitude with the consequences of this. I'm never going to complain about this situation. I'm never going to complain about the physical ramifications in my life, which I'm going to carry with me for the rest of my life. Um, I'm never going to complain about that. I'm going to have a good attitude. What did she just do? She chose what she did not choose. Amen? Did she, cha did, she ch did she choose that situation? Did she choose that circumstance? No, but she said, I'm going to make a choice to choose what I would not choose. I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to have a good attitude. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to go into despair. I'm going to make the third choice. I'm going to rejoice and be glad. I'm going to embrace this. Amen? I have lived with her for these last 40 years, and I want to testify to you that she has kept that that she's had a good attitude in this situation, amen, and still has to this very day, and I believe she will right to the end. <clears throat> Paul said this. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, he said, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, which was not bad eyesight. 
a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. People have been saying, well, I wonder what Paul's thorn was. Actually, he, he described it to us. Why don't we just read the Bible? He told us what his thorn was. He said, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it would leave me. That, that, that in the Greek, I implored the Lord three times that it would leave me. That it wasn't just three quick prayers. God, would you take this from me, number one. God, would you take this from me, number two. That's not what it means. It means three seasons of asking. Three seasons of imploring. Paul set himself on three occasions to fast and pray and call on the Lord. God, take this from me. Take this from me. And God said, no. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And then he said this, most, what? Gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content. And here's the thorn. I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. He told us what the thorn was. Why don't we just read it? Amen? Weak, it was distresses and persecutions and difficulties and insults and the Judaizers and all those things he went through and the beatings without number and the stoning and the imprisonment and being shipwrecked. All those is the thorn. Paul said, man, God, you make this so hard for me. I'm trying to preach the gospel and trying to share the kingdom and I'm continually fighting all these things and I'm spending more time in jail than out of jail. Amen? Couldn't you make my journey a little easier? But God said to him, listen, Paul, I've given you so many revelations. I've given you so much stuff. You have so much anointing in your life, man. You raise the dead. You heal the sick. You cast out devils. You plant churches. Man, you've been to heaven. You've seen. You've been in the, you've been in the paradise. You've seen things that are inexpressible. Man, I've got to keep your feet on the ground, buddy. I've got to give you a little bit of help here. And Paul, and, you know, and Paul said, man... Paul moved in power. How many want more power in your life? Want more power? Well, Paul says, what did he say about power? He said, most gladly, therefore, I'll boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. If you really want to experience the power of God and you're asking for power, you may be asking for some other things that you have not quite considered. Amen? There's a whole lot more to this Say, In the name of Jesus, oh, I feel the, I feel the anointing. Now, if we're talking about real power, God, God answers our prayers. You want some real power? All right, Dave, you know what? You're a little bit full of yourself. I need to help you a little bit here. You're not quite weak enough. Paul said, he says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Where does power come from? It comes when I am totally dependent and broken and trusting in the Lord. I've seen God do some incredible miracles in my journey, but can I tell you, the greatest miracles I have seen have been in my weakest times. The time when I felt like I had no strength, when everything that could go wrong had gone wrong, but I, had, I felt like I had zero in terms of resources to help anybody, and I saw God move in power. That's the way he works. Paul understood that. How did he understand that? How did he come to this place? He said, I will gladly, therefore, gladly boast about my weaknesses. You see, Paul, when he had these distresses and difficulties and problems, look at him when he was in the Philippian jail and was beaten with rods. What are him and Silas doing down there? They're praising God. They're worshiping. Are you kidding me? And did he see the power of God? Chains falling, prisons blowing open, jailer getting saved, church being planted. Wow. You see, Paul chose what he did not choose. He said, okay, I'm willing. Okay, God, if it's the thorn, I'm willing to embrace the thorn. I'll embrace it then. I'll hug it to myself. I'll grab onto it. I'm not asking you to take it from me anymore. I'm going to grab onto it. I'm going to rejoice in it. I'm going to be glad in it. I'm going to trust you in it. You're in charge. I'm going to choose what I would not choose. That's what I'm going to do. You know, there was a woman, Margaret Geary. I, read, I remember this happening in the news. Uh, about, it happened a few years ago. <clears throat> and I remember the story on the news. Margaret Geary is from Baltimore. She's a nun. She's 85 years old. And uh, one day, all her fellow nuns were going on a retreat. And uh, she somehow got left behind. 
And uh, she, so she's in the building by herself, and she steps into, she's got a bag of celery, and she had, a, she had a glass of water. She stepped into the elevator, and the power went out, and the elevator was stuck, and she couldn't get out of the elevator. And she spent uh, four days and three nights in the elevator with a bag of celery and a glass of water and nobody in the building. And so she tried to get the doors open, and she realized I couldn't get them open, and my fellow nuns aren't going to be back for four days. And so she could have panicked, but she said, you know what, I'm in here, might as well pray. So she sat down, and she rationed out her celery, and she sipped on her water, and when her water was gone and the celery was gone, she dug into her pocket and found out she had some cough drops, some cough candies in her pocket, and she sucked on those, and uh, she survived the four days and three nights. When they opened the doors and found out she was in there, and, she, and they got her out, they said, hey, how'd you handle that, Margaret? She said, you know what? I figured it was a gift from God. I took it as a gift that, I, hey, man, I got four days. To, well, she didn't know how long it was going to be. She said, man, I got this time. I'm going to pray. She said, I had an amazing time with God. I was just was in, the, I was in the dark. I was praying, worshiping. I had an incredible retreat. Man, it was a gift. <laughs> that was her response. Man, I, what, I got closer to God. Man, I had such an encounter with him. Wow, what a gift. <laughs> What'd she do? She chose what she didn't choose. She could have been in that elevator, kicking at the door, angry. She could have said, she could have just laid down in despair and just quit and gave up. No, she didn't do that. She chose what she wouldn't have chosen. Amen. She chose to embrace the difficulty. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Do you believe that? God causes all things to work together for good. Hard things, difficult things, things we don't understand, things that we would never choose. But we do have a choice. I, I don't have a choice in those things that happen to me. I don't have a choice with, 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 what, with what happens in members of my family or losses or, or maybe I've lost loved ones that I didn't think I would lose. Or I don't have a choice in those things. But I do have a choice about how I'm going to respond to that. I do have a choice. I can choose. I would never have chosen those things. I would never have chosen some of the, the difficulties I have in my life. You would never have chosen the things that you were going through or the things that you have gone through. My wife would never have chosen that sickness or those surgeries. She never would have chosen that. But she decided to choose what she did not choose. And I want to challenge you this morning to choose what you did not choose. Amen? If you do that... You honor God. You glorify God. You begin to release the power of God into your situation. Amen. We, you just raise the bar in your life to a whole different level. Not only that, if we do that as a congregation, we raise the bar on our congregation as a whole different level. Amen. That's what I believe for 2019. Let's stand. <clears throat> Amen. Those of you who clapped, you got the right idea. Those of you who haven't, well, you're, I know you're working on it. Let me pray for you. <laughs> Father, I just uh, stand before you this morning. And Lord, we want to confess to you that the things that we're personally facing right now, they're hard. And the things that we have gone through and the things that we've experienced in our past, and those things which seem like absolute losses to us, they seem like a loss to us, Lord, but if I, re if I choose to embrace your journey for my life, I can never lose. I will actually gain. I pray, Lord, you'd strengthen us this morning. I pray you'd strengthen the faith of every person here. Lord, the areas, maybe there's some areas which is causing our faith to wobble a little bit, causing our faith to tilt. Lord, strengthen us. Lord, would you come by the Holy Spirit? Lord, would you, Lord, give us a sense, a, a, a fresh sense of your presence? Lord, would we walk out of this room, Lord, today, would you help us to know that, God, you're with us, that you see us under our fig tree, that, God, you know everything about us, that, Lord, nothing is out of your control. And, Lord, we want to say that we don't understand the disciplines that you bring into our life. We would never choose them. 
but God, we are going to choose them. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus made that choice. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he made the choice to embrace the cross. He made the choice to choose what he didn't choose. Father, that was your choice for him. He said, Lord, if, this, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours be done. I th- I'm so thankful, Lord, that he made that choice, that he chose what he didn't choose. And Lord, I pray you'd help us this morning to choose what we didn't choose in the name of Jesus. I pray you'd strengthen us this morning. I pray you'd encourage us. Lord, I pray you'd help us to see our present difficulties in a true light and a true perspective. That, Lord, we would not be angry. We would not rebel. We would not quit. We would not give up. But, God, we would begin to choose rejoicing and choosing gladness and not the other two. I pray you'd strengthen us in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Thanks for coming this morning. Thank <clears throat>